alternative dig talk real issues real talk fellow citizens following the sequence of events uganda seems to be at political crossroads <laughs> I'm not a servant of anybody. Madam, I know the law. As such, Alternative Digital brings you the Interfest show with retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesuje. Let's keep on the same page on Alternative Digital. As he gives you the alternatives on the transition question, rule of law, human rights and freedom, youth inclusion in governance, economic stagnation as he confirms i'll be always here saturday from 10 a.m in the morning be there don't miss the live discussion on the alternative uganda digital tv facebook pages and the alternative uganda youtube channel hi rogers can i ask you something uh shoot what does corruption mean well summarily Corruption is abuse of public power for personal gain or for the benefit of a group to which one owes allegiance. For example, when a public office is abused by an official accepting or soliciting a bribe. By the way, private people can be corrupt too, like bribing police officers to escape fines. Mm, okay, so exactly how does that concern me? <laughs> well, do you pay taxes? I guess, yeah. What does that have to do with this? Everything, because those taxes you pay are supposed to facilitate services you use, like water, electricity, roads construction, medicines in hospitals, name it. Hmm, okay, that is much bigger than I thought, but it can be stopped, right? Well, yes it can, although it may not be as easy as it sounds, and here is the reason why. Corruption roots are grounded in our country's social, political, economic, bureaucratic traditions and policies. So... What has kept it going this long? I mean, why don't we stop it? Well, the main reason why it has been here for so long is because institutions are weak. Either as a result of poorly defined ethical standards of public service, weak administrative and financial systems, or ineffective watchdog agencies. Hmm. What can we do to stop it? Um, at a national level, we must focus on strengthening the independence and effectiveness of public institutions that fight corruption. At a personal level, we must commit to never giving a bribe. I promise I'll never give a bribe. Well, that's a great decision you have made. Me and you now have to spread this message to all our friends. If we all do our part, corruption will be no more. This message is brought to you by Alternative Digital. But the church, you know. Tell him, man, what's up? Man, can you imagine people just dump everywhere? Someone drinks water and throws the bottle wherever. Come on, Rogers. What else do you expect people to do with an empty bottle? Did you know that plastics take at least 450 years to decompose? What? That's a long time. Exactly. Because plastics are made out of a lightweight and flexible material that doesn't decompose easily. And plastics everywhere in the environment cause plastic pollution. What is plastic pollution now? It is the accumulation of plastic waste in the environment, like bottles, polythene bags, straws, all of these contribute to plastic pollution. I have been using them without knowing their effect. Yeah, a lot of people have. Plastics are a danger to the ecosystem, both on land and in water. So how can we overcome this problem? Is there something we can do? Oh yes, we can reduce by minimizing the use of plastics, reuse by repurposing them, or recycle by collecting and processing them into new products. Everyone wants to change the world, but no one wants to change themselves for the world. How about we change our habits for the world? And, and it, it starts, starts with, with me and, and you. you. This message is brought to you by Alternative Digitalk. The Alternative Digitalk. Real issues. Real talk. Greetings ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Interface Show. Today is a Saturday 
15th of July 2023. Welcome aboard. Thank you so much for tuning in to yet another interesting and insightful discussion that happens every Saturday starting from 10 to midday. Every Saturday, you know, we have retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesija to just help us touch base on some of the issues that have been trending or some of the news that has been going around uh, throughout the week. We had him last week, but that was the Luganda version. And of course, this week we are uh, going to be speaking English in this particular episode. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in. It's a privilege and honor having you on the show. It's always, always something we do not take lightly because we know uh, we are here to serve you. So every time you tune in every Saturday for two hours, it's always our pleasure and privilege having you right here. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We're going to be talking about a lot of issues, starting from the presidential address uh, on security that happened on uh, Thursday, that was the 13th. Uh, we had President Museven come out and highlight, especially or uh, predominantly on the Kasese uh, killings. We're going to talk about that. There's still also uh, the Balalo question there in. Uh, so feel free to just send in some of uh, your messages. I'll be reading them uh, subsequently. Or actually, you can just uh, contribute to this particular show. Share this link. Uh, to as many people as you can so that, uh, you know, we make sure that this information does not only stick with you, uh, but it sticks with uh, some of your colleagues. And I hope that it can make you or it can help you make informed decisions and make Uganda a better place. As you well know, every Saturday it's always retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesija right here with us on set uh, to demystify some of the issues that have been going on uh, throughout the week. The hashtag is hash, the interface show that is on Facebook, Twitter, or you can just look us out, up at uh, the Alternative Uganda Facebook page, at Digitalk TV Facebook page, on YouTube. Uh, we are also there at the Alternative Uganda, at Digitalk TV on Twitter at the alternative UGA. Just uh, uh, look us up there and uh, just send in a message, uh, drop us a like or a share, and we shall be able, uh, you'll be able to contribute to this insightful discussion. Without any further ado, allow me to welcome the guest of the day and uh, uh, allow him to say hi to us and tell us how his week is. Doctor, you're welcome to the interface today. Thank you very much, uh, Edgar, and uh, I hope you are aware yourself. I'm all right. Uh, very good morning to all the uh, viewers wherever you are joining us from on this uh, interface uh, program i hope you've had a good week uh, challenging as life is generally for most most people uh, because of the economic hell that we live in because of the uh, challenges of health. Uh, you know, there are many people grappling with ill health and looking after patients. And uh, yeah, my sympathies uh, go and, and, and thoughts go all out to you. And of course, those who have lost uh, dear ones in this uh, week, my uh, deep felt sympathies uh, to all families that have lost dear ones. Edgar, uh, at the last uh, um, session we had here last week, uh, just that morning, we had lost one of our uh, veteran uh, activists and freedom fighter, mm -hmm. the Honorable Charles Angiro Gutumoy, yes. um, who is going to be uh, buried on the 21st. Uh, in his home in Nerute, and um, you know we continue to grieve over these losses. Mm. Only yesterday I was attending a funeral service of another activist, uh, a very vibrant young man uh, from Tororo, uh, Godfrey Ocho, mm. uh, who. Uh, also passed away and is being buried tomorrow. And uh, there are many uh, deaths all around. Um, uh, maybe we should have a session to talk about what uh, is causing um, many people, especially those who are still young, uh, to get out of uh, our society in that way. Mm. So. Um, I continue to send condolences to uh, the families of our activists who are grieving and uh, 
to pray that God continues to strengthen us. Of course, there are also uh, people out there or people out there who are having uh, celebratory functions, uh, uh, people finishing their education, um, people having, uh, you know, holy matrimony and, uh, and all other kinds of functions, birthdays and so on, whoever is having a celebration. I, uh, you know, I wish you all the best and uh, merrymaking. So I hope we have a good conversation this morning. Welcome once again. All right. Um, unfortunately, bit we are starting at, on a sad note. You also mentioned that one of your colleagues uh, died and uh, one of your uh, ardent freedom fighters. And it's due to road carnage, unfortunately. Even this week, after you left the, the previous show, there was also some accidents. We had a link bus. Uh, we had another bus also having road carnage. The, the driver there in also passed on. Doctor, um, we are seeing that at least the parliament wants to enforce at least some more laws, talking about the driving uh, limit and things like that. Um, <laughs> is, is, are we just a reactionary government, really? Or do we have to sit down and really plan for this? Because you've mentioned that road accidents have taken a lot of lives, I think even bigger lives than, than war has taken, really. Um, Very and, uh, much so. So, so, so doctor, what, what, what is your take on this solution? No, it's part of the... Uh, of the collapse of systems. Mm. It's part of the crisis that we have been, uh, you know, discussing. There is a deep, uh, entrenched crisis now, all round crisis. It's not just the road accidents. It's, it's like I have said, the collapse of the healthcare system, yeah. which is also causing, you know, a lot of deaths. It is uh, the, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, insecurity, uh, people who are being shot and killed, and uh, the violence, the robberies, the war. It's, it's, it's a crisis that arises, that, you know, is all embracing. You can't just talk about a road, you can't just talk about healthcare, you can't just talk about education, you can't, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a broad, uh, it's, which comes, as I have pointed out many times, from the system of government itself. That it's a system which is controlled by a few people, controlled and benefits a few people at the expense of everybody else. And so there is systemic decay on the part of the common good while a few people uh, you know continue to amass wealth and to uh, prosper and to even send wealth outside and while the country is degenerating. This is where it comes from. So this deep crisis cannot be solved by you know some knee-jerk reactions on, on, on the roads, uh, and even, on, on, you know, if you want to even just deal with transportation, it's also, it's not just that you enforce rules on the road, it's the uh, design of the roads, <laughs> even where you are going to enforce the rules, the design is wrong. Even you cannot enforce the rules actually on the roads because uh, you don't have an infrastructure that allows you to enforce anything. Because you see, for a road to be, uh, uh, you know, one in which you can, on, one on which you can enforce rules, must meet, must meet some standards. That you have road markings which show what uh, road users should do that if you are going this side, this is your lane. Mm. You must have road markings that you don't drive on the shoulders of the roads where maybe the civilians are. And you must have markings show where the road ends. You must have signs which show, uh, for example, speed limits which show where the 
hamsa, witro, we have a sharp corners, a witro. You must have some infrastructure that allows you then to say, follow the rules. Or even for people to know the rules, they, they, they must uh, be taught according to what is there. If you are telling, if you are in a driving school, in fact, I don't know how they, 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 they teach people in the driving schools when the things they would be teaching about are not there. Because like those road markings, uh, you should have learned what they mean, road signs, what they mean before you get a, a, a driving permit. But if they are not there for you to see and appreciate, uh, I don't even know whether how they teach uh, learners of driving in, in driving schools. Mm -hmm. So this is why I'm saying that it, it, whether it's in the transportation sector, whether it's in the education, health, or water system, or electricity, or what, the, uh, the, the, the failures are systemic and entrenched. That's why we need a global reset. It cannot be uh, sorted out by tinkering with just uh, a, a, a few patches here and there. No, we need a holistic management of the crisis. And to, aren't we just uh, politicizing this issue? Uh, you say there's a systematic decay, which may be there, um, maybe according to, to, to some people like yourself. But, but doctor, also, when do we start to say that uh, maybe uh, we are to blame as, as the people, maybe being reckless? Because uh, you have driven on these roads for, for more than 30 years. Maybe you've, you've been surviving. So you want to say that this has been by the grace of God? Or maybe these, these individuals themselves are, are to blame for, for this particular issue. Because we drive also, but, but maybe... You see, the reason, recklessness. the very reason rules regulations, laws, even a constitution, the reason all these things are made is to guide the, the, the many people who form the community on what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. So you must set the standards, first thing. Secondly, you must be able to enforce the standards you have set. First of all, when you set the standards, you must make sure everybody understands the standards so that they act consciously. Mm. You know? Yes. When we were growing up, you know, the code of, the, of, 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 of using the roads was taught in the primary schools, it was written on every exercise book, at the back of the exercise book, mm. there were, you know, rules there used on how to cross the road, on how to do this, and, mm. you know. So, you, first of all, you, you create the standards. Secondly, you get people to know, understand them. Mm. Thirdly, you enforce them. Uh, and this is, uh, therefore, yes, the population has a role, has a duty to follow uh, rules and regulations. Mm. But those regulations must be made. They must be made aware that these are the rules, mm. you know, uh, so that they are able, uh, you know, so where is that training now mm. which was there? 40, 50 years ago. In Naguru, the, isn't it there? And they learning? No, I'm talking about in every primary school. You know, where they, they would read this and make drills and what. You know, so there is a, the, the major, the catastrophic failure is in how to manage the common good, common goods and services. It's a, 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 a a failure of, uh, of governance. That's, the, that's where the catastrophic failure is because people uh, need to have information, 
to appreciate it so that they willfully, without coercion, without uh, that they they act accordingly. Mm. Because even in the developed societies where you see, and it doesn't even have to be the developed societies. Mm. Uh, look what just our neighbors in Rwanda. Mm. Why are their roads uh, different from ours? Do they have more money? It's not a function of money. Mm. Why isn't littering, you know, finding, <laughs> is it just a function of uh, Banyarwanda being cleaner, <laughs> than inherently cleaner than Ugandans? Absolutely not. <laughs> so it's a governance failure. Uh, yes, people have a responsibility, mm. but the driver, the coordinator of all the activities mm. that lead to the outcome we need is the role of the state of governance. And that's where the failure, the catastrophic failure is. Because even if people uh, were, you know, conscious, how can they affect the road design? The fact that we, do, we make roads without, for example, pedestrian walks, that everybody, the, the persons on foot are squeezing themselves on the road, the, the border borders are on the same, uh, the, there is no place where a border border can pass, where a, a pedestrian can pass, where the vehicles should pass. They are all fighting for the, the bicycle. Is, they are all fighting for the same narrow road. What can, in your, even if you are the most uh, well-intentioned person, uh, if you want to move between here and there, this is the path that you have. Everywhere else is buildings, is what? Uh, nobody has regulated uh, how uh, close to the road people should build. Nobody has regulated how a road should be designed and uh, built so that you separate the different road users so that they don't collide. Uh, at junctions, you don't find any uh, road markings as to who has the right of way <laughs> and things like that. So. Yes, people have a responsibility, but uh, in this case, the catastrophic failure is that of governance. Okay, um, Doctor, that is well noted. I, th I hope the people who are responsible can actually take um, um, some advice from there. I, I want us to just delve into the discussion of Mr. President's pres uh, address that was on uh, Thursday, uh, this particular week. Uh, first of all, he started by uh, reminding us of... Um, uh, the attacks that were, de were done in the past uh, around 1997 and 1998. And he said that uh, we had defe they had defeated um, the ADF from that time up to uh, around 2007. Uh, first of all, he asserted that fighters are cowards. Um, uh, the, the ADF are cowards. Uh, they, why are they attacking, really, uh, the people who are young children and, um, uh, you know, civilians? He said it's better to attack armed personnel. Uh, he said there are some measures that were taken in the past to make sure that they fight ADF. One of those was um, not allowing uh, the ADF to have territory, and he, has say, he said uh, that this they have achieved. Uh, the second was to stop them from taking power, and he assured that this has also been achieved. Uh, then he said to stop them from destabilizing rural persons, uh, people who are living in their communities, and you know, forcing them to, have, to be internally displaced. And he said this has been achieved, though in the recent past we've seen some people from Kasese, uh, you know, trying to run away from uh, the border where the attacks were. Remember for the Lubiriha attacks uh, therein. Uh, so the president uh, asserted this. And uh, uh, there was a bit of ridicule to the media, especially the Daily Monitor newspaper, and says uh, this is uh, an enemy and it's an agent for some other uh, people who have their own ideologies. I, I don't know what Ugandans and the Daily Monitor think about this. Um, then you also uh, assured Ugandans, due to the strong intelligence uh, that has been built over time, that Uganda is uh, still safe. Even in that presidential address, we had Mr. President uh, depict some images of um, uh, how they have attacked uh, the different, uh, or how they attacked the different uh, camps of the ADF terrorists in um, uh, Congo, how they bombed them up. And of course, he showed uh, some uh, bizarre images of uh, 
the victims of the ADF attacks. Uh, we saw young people, young children who have been uh, decapitated. Uh, we saw, you know, uh, people who have been cut, people who have been killed. And uh, of course, according to the president, these are all victims of the ADF. Uh, he assured Ugandans uh, that they are still safe. And of course, uh, uh, there is nothing to really worry about. ADF is not a threat to Uganda. That is what uh, President Museveni in his uh, uh, presidential address, he tried to highlight that in. The question is, how accurate are some of the claims made by the president here, according to um, um, Dr. Kizavesi? Doctor, uh, last episode, you talked about this particular issue, the Kasese, and president also came out this week to highlight the state of security. And the main thing he was emphasizing was um, where the Kasese killings that happened earlier last uh, in June. Doctor, what is your comment on this? Um, the president is saying Uganda is safe, um, that we are exaggerating, and the Daily Monitor, which has been dubbed opposition, really, uh, has been exaggerating, and they are agents of a certain narrative that they are trying to put across about Uganda. What is your comment on that? Well, unfortunately, Edgar, I didn't uh, listen to what Mr. Museveni had to say. Mm. Uh, uh, he, I think, uh, said it when I had other competing uh, activities. You didn't boycott, like some not of the really. I, if I, if I, if I have time, hmm. I, I want to see what he says because, uh, although. 90% of the things he says are generally lies and misrepresentations. They indicate, they, they, are, they also offer good indicators uh, of what the truth <laughs> is likely to be. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, uh, and, and he's, uh, he's still directing the affairs of the state is still controlling our resources. Mm. So it's not wise uh, not, to, not to know what he's saying mm. uh, and interpret it according to how you want to interpret it. Use whatever he's saying the way you want to use it. And certainly get the first opportunity uh, to, to give a view that will help others also understand. <laughs> because the reason he comes out indeed is to create, to influence uh, some understanding, create uh, uh, some um, impressions amongst the people. Usually the wrong impressions. And uh, it's our duty to the extent that we can to give uh, another view so that people are better informed to make, uh, uh, are able to make informed decision. So unfortunately I didn't see or hear what uh, he was uh, uh, presenting. So I can only respond to what you present as what he said. <laughs> I hope that what you present is uh, uh, is what he said because you know like you are saying that he said that one of the, the strength of his government is intelligence that he has a strong intelligence mm. but indeed I just read in the monitor which you have said he castigated mm. the monitor is saying that uh, he said the attack on Kasese was a result of intelligence failure so I, I am not so sure whether he said the intelligence is very strong or whether he said that uh, he blamed intelligence on the killing of the people in Kasese. But uh, talking uh, about the security situation, you see, rather than even become uh, consumed by the details of 
of what happened in Kasese and what happens in uh, different incidents, I think it's, it may be more helpful to generally look at the dynamics of insecurity, mm. uh, dynamics of violence, the dynamics of, uh, uh, you know, armed, uh, um, uh, armed insurgents and, and, and gun violence. Uh, if we look at those and what drives them, then it's easier to put that in, in uh, um, against what Mr. Museven is saying and maybe make sense of it. Because first of all, although we have forces in Congo, we have forces in Sudan, I think, we have forces in Somalia, we have forces, and we have had perennial insecurity here. No country has ever attacked us, ever, since we became Uganda before and during Museven's uh, uh, leadership. No, no country has ever attacked us. So the insecurity, the violence, and all the troubles we have are domestically generated. They, are, they, they come from ourselves. Uh, and what causes them? What causes that? Because, and Mr. Museven himself knows that him and uh, his armed insurgents, who included my good self, for five years were a source of insecurity. In the period within which it's estimated about half a million people died. Now, the fighting that was going on between 1981, 1986, was fighting between Ugandans, uh, and which resulted in all that. Why was it there? What, what was the driver? I don't know whether Mr. Museveni sometimes stops to think that if the drivers that caused him to cause that insurgency himself could do so, could the same drivers be driving similar people like him <laughs> to cause other insurgencies? So one needs to look at what is the driver of armed insurgency. We spent 20 years with the Northern Uganda insurgency. We spent I don't know how many years with the Eastern Uganda insurgency. Now, ADF is still rambling on. A few, while, a, 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 a few uh, years, I think two or three years ago, there were the Bijambia uh, violence in the uh, uh, central region here. Uh, so what is driving this? And he says he has crushed them. So if you crush the insurgents, have you crushed why the insurgents have begun? And if you have not crushed what motivated the insurgency to start, uh, are you safe? But doctor, sorry, but what, you're using the word insurgency. Mm. Is this really an insurgency or um, they're, they're just criminal activities? Because when you realize, you know, that, the, the IDF are not really fighting to capture territory, really. It's, they're just... You know, the, I, I don't, I don't even, I don't even know whether, I don't even know whether they are ADF. 
that is a characterization that is being made by some people. I don't know whether they are ADF. When ADF started, it was seeking to take over power. It captured the territory. Mm. It, it, yes, it yeah. attacked not just Mpondu. It attacked and advanced and uh, took over territory, actually a large territory at that time. And they had to be fought and pushed back. So, and they have, by the way, the, uh, that ADF had its political agenda published. So it's not that they did not have a mission, a political mission. They had a political mission which they wanted to execute using arms. So, if you want to call that an insurgency or... Uh, a terrorist group. Of course, even terrorists have political agendas. So whether you assign them, uh, terrorism is just a method of, of conducting, of fighting. Not a justifiable method, if you ask me, mm. but it's nonetheless a method. And you see, weak people will fight with the means they can afford. So if you have overwhelming power, that's why uh, you see the, the unfortunate situation in, uh, in Palestine, uh, in, the, in, the, in the war between uh, the Israelis and, uh, and the Palestinians. The Palestinians have very little they can use, uh, but they try to use it. And sometimes, indeed, in a manner that is uh, seen as a, a t t terrorist. So uh, we should understand that all people who are fighting have causes. They may be justified causes, they may be unjustified causes, but they have causes. Nobody sets out to go and fight without a cause. And all I am saying is, have we focused on the causes that cause that bring this uh, insecurity, so that the causes are, are are removed? And I have said some causes may be justified, some causes may be unjustified, but whether they are justified or not justified, they are causes that need to be addressed and removed. Do you want to, sh to share some of those causes, causes in your perspective, some of the things you think are causing these insurgencies, what you call insurgencies? Well, the very reasons that, for example, myself, I became an insurgent, mm. took up guns against a government, was injustice. Yes. Injustice and abuse of my rights, abuse of human rights. And, um, uh, you know, in total disregard of the law. So, the absence of protection of the law. So, you are being abused, but you have nowhere to run to. Then you say, then I must fight to, to even if I die fighting, uh, you know. So, injustice, and there are all kinds of injustices uh, for example, people whose land is being grabbed, you know, and there are many people that have been evicted from their lands. Uh, they can choose to say, no, 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 since we have nothing to lose now, let us fight. Uh, and, and, and so, the other, the other, the other day, uh, when Museveni, uh, Mr. Museveni wrote about Bukede by elections, yes. he said uh, these things that, that Paul Mwanga was doing. In these are the things that took us to the... At least then we can say he knows that there's, uh, there are, these things are there. Yeah, so he's fighting them. No, he's the one who does them. So he, he definitely you can, he cannot do what he doesn't know. Those very things, I have taken them to court. And the court has confirmed that they are there, which he was doing. So it's not that he doesn't know. Mm. The, the whole thing is that uh, he may be hopes that what is good for him is not good for others. 
that for him he could go and fight because his elections were stolen. But others should not fight because they, they have been unfairly treated because they have no voice. Mm. And that is not sustainable. So um, the cause of it, the violence in Uganda, the insecurity in Uganda is unaddressed or poorly addressed uh, causes that people have causes and largely revolving around issues of justice. Because even Muslims, for example, yes. Muslims have been, uh, uh, I believe rightly, uh, aggrieved that they have been targeted uh, as a community uh, to be assumed that they are, uh, they, they, they are criminals and they can be, you know, uh, removed and uh, uh, put in jails and, you know, many hundreds of Muslims have been arrested, including around suspicions of being supporters of ADF. Not tried <laughs> for very, very long periods, sometimes ultimately just freed and rearrested and freed and, you know, that kind of thing, if, if a community feels that uh, we, we don't have as much freedom and as much right as others, then they can feel compelled to fight for their freedom and for their right. So all I am saying is we have not addressed causes for what, what the administration of Mr. Museveni concentrates on mm. is looking for how to crash. We shall crash these ones. We shall crash those. We shall finish these ones. We shall never the causes. What causes this to happen? As long as you have not addressed it, have you addressed why Corn could and 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 uh, Alisila Kwena before Corn and others why they fought for that long? Have you addressed it? Have you addressed the insurgency that happened in the East and its effects? Because as part of the effects, you know, there was looting of people's properties in those areas. Uh, up to now, the people who lost their cows and so on in all those areas, they have never been paid. Although there was, they were promised as part of resettlement uh, that they would be compensated, nothing. So those are the things if we want to deal with security issues that need to be addressed. The, 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 that is armed insurgency. But there is also armed crime, mm. ordinary crime, mm. robberies of, uh, of, of, mobile of, money. of mobile money things, mob, robberies of uh, uh, maybe banks, robberies of... Uh, uh, people on the road uh, who are moving from one place to another, uh, there is that uh, insecurity. D D Doctor, before you even delve there, because I was going to ask you that separately, Mr. President did not mention anything about that. But uh, uh, do, what do you suggest we do? Do you think uh, we, there's a school of thought that has been going on? And some people think dialogue. We're talking to these uh, insurgents, the ADF and and the rest of the of the people. Do you think that is enough? Talking to them, really, will, will that be? You okay? see, any attempt to talk mm. should first and foremost be an attempt at finding the cause. Exactly to touch base on really why you do yes, what you do. Yes, yes, yes. So one should inquire into the causes and use all means of doing so, of inquiring into the causes. Now, once the causes are clear, how to address those causes is the next stage. How do we address this? 
in a manner that will resolve it sustainably. Uh, and, and, and that could take, you know, many forms, but arising out of understanding what the cause is. And yes, part of addressing that is uh, indeed uh, having a dialogue with those who are engaged in, in that, depending on which, as I have said there, once you understand the cause, it gives you an opening on how to address it. But you see, in all that, the inevitability that must be uh, taken into account is the fact that all these are your citizens. They're Ugandan. Yes. These are your taxpayers. They are your citizens. They are, you are not going to wish them away. So, and you are not going to kill all of them because even others will keep on coming. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, even the leader of ADF is, is believed to be in, in their prison. Yes. And they have arrested I don't know how many, but have, they have not. So that's why it's important to deal in, with, the, with the issues of insurgency mm -hmm. or armed struggle for whatever, of whatever type uh, in a manner that we resolve it sustainably. Do we even want to, to do this? Because, Doctor, let me just get a basis for the opposition players here. Even talking to the president, it's, it's like a demonic move. You real, people demonize talking to the president, or they, they see it with a lot of contempt. Why, why, why even talking to him? Even seeing a photo with one of an NRM card. Yes, you know and, and, and that... So aren't we preaching water and, and drinking No, soda? no, no, no. That is what has been uh, a result of his actions. You see, again, never interested in solving the problem, the root cause of the problem, but either crushing or neutralizing in other ways, buying, whatever. So any engagement mm -hmm. is seen as one that will end up in that, in that way. But otherwise, we have said very many times and attempted mm. very many times to have dialogue uh, with, uh, with, with uh, uh, Mr. Seven's uh, uh, Junta. Mm. We have had, we have tried. But his approach is not any different because even he says that we are enemies. Like he's calling monitor an enemy. Mm. Uh, so, you see, as they say, you know, if one is a hammer, they see uh, every other problem as a nail that they should <laughs> they should hammer. They they don't see uh, they, they 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 hardly see other uh, kinds of uh, of approaches. So his approach ever is militaristic. We, shall, we should kill them. We should crush them. We should uh, neutralize them. That is the language he uses. You remember even he said, by 2021, there will be no opposition here in Uganda. I mean, what kind of a person is that? Who thinks opposition is inimical should not exist? Because, so he thinks in Uganda we should all have thinking of one type, there should not be different types of uh, approaches that people espouse, you know, because if you think, so he, he actually believes that whatever he thinks is the correct, is the only correct way. And that's why he has been talking about our correct line. So he thinks he has a correct line. He is, he is the, the wisest person. Uh, what he thinks is the right thing. And all others who, are, who have different uh, uh, way of looking at things uh, must be enemies of the right thing. <laughs> you know, 
this is actually a philosophy now that is beginning to attract a lot of analysis and research. Mm. Political popularism is, uh, is, is a dangerous phenomenon. So some, someone thinking that they know it all. It's yes, a, yes, they think, they think they are the most uh, intelligent. They think what they espouse is the correct thing. They, and also they think, they, they divide people in uh, be, 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 being on the right side and on the wrong side. And those on the wrong side to be crushed. They look at them as enemies. So it is, it is an element, it is a, a, uh, because even the fascism, fascism as as uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, as is understood to have happened, evolved, was along the same lines, uh, and and how they, that's how even uh, Hitler uh, wanted to thought there were pure people and people that should be that are. Uh, uh, a danger to society who should be eliminated, who should all be removed, who are not pure, who should be removed. This thinking of Mr. Museveni is along the same lines. It's fascist in nature, populist and fascist. And that's why uh, it's extremely dangerous. So he does not feel that opposition is legitimate. So he had a mission to eliminate, and proud of it, to eliminate opposition by 2021. So where does opposition go if he eliminates it? It goes underground to, because its views have not been destroyed. The, nobody will be forced to have the same views as Mr. Museveni. So if he terrorizes everybody who has a similar view, they go underground and fight. And that's why he will never solve insecurity in Uganda because of not addressing the causes, because of perpetuating injustice. You perpetuate injustice, you are sowing the seed of insecurity. Then it looks like if we go according to your school of thought, that means we're going to have more insurgents, we're going to have more de people who feel they are disenfranchised and fighting, and that means this, this cycle of violence is going to continue and continue and continue. Without doubt. Without doubt. And, um, and you see, it's not just people who are outside the Museveni's uh, whatever he calls political organization, where he functions from, like now, says is the NRM. You see, there is no NRM. NRM is his thinking. So even those within his NRM, if they think he's addressing something wrongly, the response to them is not different from the response he makes towards us. The likes of the messages. Yes. Don't forget, that's where we came that's from. That's what I'm saying. The messages, the rear category. Yes, yes. yes. That's, and that, so that has never stopped. Anybody from within NRM who espouses a different kind of thinking is wrong and must be dealt with. Is, is subversive. <laughs> it must be dealt with firmly. Uh, and those who are, not, who are not careful and persist there thinking that, who are not just careful, but who are not appreciative of the situation they are dealing with, uh, some have lost their lives, you know, in that kind of uh, situation. Mm. So this is a very, very serious matter that will not be solved by the attitude and approach 
of Mr. Museveni. Of crushing. Because yes. even in it is the attitude and approach of Mr. Museveni mm -hmm. that uh, creates a lot of the insecurity that we have here. Mm -hmm. Both political insecurity, the, the, the insurgents, but also economic, mm -hmm. economic insecurity. The, 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 those who are looking for, for how to survive and, and rob, rob others on the highways, on the, uh, those on, wherever there is any money, supermarkets, what, you know, the robberies that take place uh, are a result of his ideology. The real ideology of Mr. Museveni. Because uh, how is that then? Because if we've seen that what you're saying is actually accurate. Hmm. Many of the attacks that have been happening recently have been linked. If it's not an, uh, an officer who, have, who has been under that, maybe his gun or a gun from a certain barracks or a certain attachment has been linked to those crimes. So please demystify it for us. What, what do you really mean by it's, it's a throwing effect of what Museveni is doing? It's now also in, 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 the, in the security. Yeah, system. because you see, as I have said, the, insurg the political insurgents mm. are out of political grievances mm. that are not being addressed. Yes. The economic insurgents are out of the exclusion, the, the economic exclusion, mm. where they have no means of subsistence, no means of survival, mm. because what would have been their means of survival has been sacked by the Museveni control system because he controls all wealth in the country. And it's also his, it's ideological. Mm -hmm. He wants to control all wealth so that everybody depends on him. He's the, he's the giver. That's why even he has created that big vote for donations. He is the donor. He is the giver. He is Mugabe. The president. Yeah. In, in, in Angola, that was also the, the, na the meaning of the Mugabe. Uh, the, Mugabe. the cultural leader of the Angola. Yes. Right? The, 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 not the cultural leader, the, the king. The king. Uh, the yeah. king of Angola, mm. the name of the king of Angola was Mugabe. Because Mugabe controlled the wealth. And he, could, he, he was the one who would govern would give. So he's the Mugabe of Uganda and controls the wealth of Uganda and exclude, in doing so, excludes everybody else. Mm. And so the people who are excluded, who also want their children to go to school, who also want to raise money to take people to health, who want to raise money because even when they start up the small businesses, revenue authority comes and, uh, and crushes them by their taxes and so on, extracting, trying to extract. So, uh, and, and, and some of these who are uh, in that exclusion are soldiers. Because look at the situation of soldiers. Four years nearly after Mr. Museveni came to power. Those soldiers on whom he depends, have nowhere to sleep. The greatest majority of them have nowhere to sleep. They sleep in shacks. They sleep in uniports shared by families. They sleep in humiliating conditions, those soldiers. Their families are totally uh, deprived of means of livelihood. You know, just getting food, just getting clothes, just getting their children to, school, to reasonable schools or so, that those basics are not there. So what happens? These soldiers will use their guns to go and look for how to bridge the gap. Because a gun can be a source of income. Yeah, they, want to, they go and look for how to bridge the gap. And uh, some indeed who are desperate, like you saw Sabiti, turning the guns on, <laughs> on, on, on their bosses and so on. All of this is a result of the economic exclusion. So there is political exclusion, 
it results in insurgency. There is economic exclusion, it results in uh, the robberies and attacks that we see. Because th that's why we, we were talking about here some time back. Those who are privileged building walls around their homes because, it, so there is a physical exclusion. Those inside the walls have food. Those outside the walls have no food. And that's why those inside the walls must build real uh, prisons for themselves mm -hmm. with high walls, with the singing on top of the high walls, with the cameras, with the dogs, with what? To protect the food they have inside against the hungry people that are outside there. <laughs> that, that is your narrative, Doctor. We, we take a break now. But when you come back, you've also not, talk, not talked about there is also a judicial exclusion because the, the things you mentioned are skeletons we've buried. There are years and years of injustice of people who have not received justice up to today. And so there's also that. So, Doctor, when we come back from the break is this issue of individualism. How does it look like? God forbid, let's say, uh, the president does not wake up tomorrow. How does Uganda look like? And this seed that we are sowing now, how does it replicate to another 50 years of Uganda? Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking about that issue and, of course, the Balalo question therein. And we'll be also raising some of the questions you ask. This is the Mighty Drive. So this is the International Show. Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk. Fellow citizens, following the sequence of events, Uganda seems to be at political crossroads. I'm not a servant of anybody. <laughs> Madam, I know the law. <laughs> As such, Alternative Digital brings you the Interfest show with retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesuje. Let's keep on the same page on Alternative Digital. As he gives you the alternatives on the transition question, rule of law, human rights and freedom, youth inclusion in governance, economic stagnation, as he confirms. I'll be always here Saturday from 10 a.m in the morning. Be there. Don't miss the live discussion on the Alternative Uganda, Digitalk TV Facebook pages and the Alternative Uganda YouTube channel. Looking for a pair of shoes? Less Up Stores has a wide range of selection for unisex footwear. We have the best quality of all brands at pocket-friendly prices and we make deliveries countrywide. Just plus your order or reach us on 0772-080090. You can also check up at Less Up stores on all our social media platforms. Less Up, craft your own footprints. What the church do? Tell him man, what's up? Man, can you imagine people just dump everywhere? Someone drinks water and throws the bottle wherever. Come on, Rogers. What else do you expect people to do with an empty bottle? Did you know that plastics take at least 450 years to decompose? What? That's a long time. Exactly. Because plastics are made out of a lightweight and flexible material that doesn't decompose easily. And plastics everywhere in the environment cause plastic pollution. What is plastic pollution now? It is the accumulation of plastic waste in the environment, like bottles, polythene bags, straws, all of these contribute to plastic pollution. I have been using them without knowing their effect. Yeah, a lot of people have. Plastics are a danger to the ecosystem, both on land and in water. So how can we overcome this problem? Is there something we can do? Oh yes, we can reduce by minimizing the use of plastics, reuse by repurposing them, or recycle by collecting and processing them into new products. Everyone wants to change the world, but no one wants to change themselves for the world. How about we change our habits for the world? And, and it, it starts, starts with, with me and, and you. you. This message is brought to you by Alternative Digitalk. The Alternative
alternative dig talk real issues real talk from that short commercial break you're still watching the interface my name is Karanga Edgar Matthew I am still with Dr. Kiza BCJ we finished with the first hour of the show this is the second and final hour of the show and uh, we're still talking about uh, you know uh, what has been happening uh, throughout the week and of course the presidential address there is so doctor you mentioned a lot of pertinent issues uh, before we went for the break and uh, you you talked about the exclusion in the politics side uh, the economic sector in the judicial and the justice sector and of course i was asked you a question that just in case uh, uh, the president was not to be here god forbid what would happen and what does in this intrigue uh, you know shine a light about Uganda or where does Uganda go in such a situation of individualism of everybody looking out for themselves and of course God for us all how does this really look out and play out for young people like ourselves who are you know it's frightening it's Uganda. frightening that um, you know we are where we are yes and indeed uh, there is a high risk of uh, the country degenerating into widespread civil strife and state collapse. There is a real danger, uh, which is not limited here, but to situations like ours. Mm. Uh, anybody who has followed the history of the African states that have become failed states, what we have here shows all the ingredients of a trajectory that ends into failed state. Uh, what is playing out in the Sudan was constructed by Bashir yes. as an attempt to maintain power. What eventually became the failed state of Somalia was similarly constructed. What is playing out in the Central African Republic, Republic today uh, is traceable to similar construct in the country. And so it's dangerous, and, and several other places. It's a dangerous place to be for our country. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the attempt by Mr. Museven indeed to create uh, a succession through his son is not helpful either. Uh, it, in fact, uh, further uh, incites uh, factionalism, uh, ethnic hatred, you know, all of which have been, uh, you know, growing, so bottled. <laughs> they are there, but they are bottled. And anybody who was, for example, here in 2009, when there was what was called Kayunga riots, when Sabasaja Kabaka of Uganda was prohibited from visiting the Saza of Bugerere, we will know that the, those riots were not just limited to the grievance 
then of, of the time of, of mm. denial yes. to visit, but it spread to other grievances, some of which were uh, showing, you know, uh, the biases against other ethnic groups and so on and so forth. So these, uh, you know, uh, grievances arising out of exclusion, of political exclusion, economic exclusion, and uh, social uh, other social as exclusion from other social aspects. Uh, and create a potential for an explosive situation. Uh, whether actually, you know, Museveni uh, departs in the manner that you, 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 you indicate or suggest that he doesn't wake up, or whether he is actually still uh, very much active, uh, all these things are possible. And that is why we have been appealing to Ugandans to be proactive and manage a transition. Because Mr. Museven is not going to cede, he's not going to give way. We must force him to go so that we plan how to force him to go. And then either there will be an explosion that we have not or an implosion, uh, some uh, disturbance that of a, of a very serious magnitude that we have not uh, planned for, that is totally unplanned for, and therefore unmanageable, mm. or uh the, uh the the trajectory you talk about can happen where uh you know he uh, breathes his last in whatever way and then the aftermath similarly becomes uh, unmanageable yeah, because, because we have no direction because we have not set ourselves to put in place mm. mechanisms to manage it we must we must be proactive. We must be proactive in managing this. And uh, this is precisely why we have been uh, trying to create a social movement, hmm. a, 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 a platform on which all Ugandans, regardless of their political parties, regardless uh, of their, uh, because, you know, many people in, the, the greatest majority of people who say they are in NRM, they are as captive as those who are outside NRM. Their situation is exactly the same. And it's, uh, you know, it's evidenced in the way you hear speeches at the death when it, whether it's somebody who has been active in NRM, who has died, the speeches will be the same. First, that they died after a lot of frustration in trying to get health care. <laughs> Regardless of whether they are NRM, whether they are FDC, whether they are NOOP, you'll hear the same, same speeches. They, 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 either they were, uh, you know, in the Cancer Institute or some other place struggling to get health care that was not uh, forthcoming. It was too expensive. They were fundraising to take somebody to India. They were doing, you know, it is the same story regardless of which political persuasion uh, the, 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 the person who has died comes from. 
Secondly, at the burial, you'll hear the same lamentations of what happens to the orphans. <laughs> How will they now uh, get education? And now even uh, uh, funerals have become places of fundraising. For the family. Let's now, we don't know how they will start the next week. <laughs> Can we do something? Uh, and uh, the basket starts moving around because, and this is whether they are NRM, whether they are NOOP, whether they are FDC, it doesn't matter. So it is the reason we all need to get to a common platform and manage how to get out of the crisis that the country finds itself in now. And we have helped to, first of all, we, we have written some uh, documents, one, to crystallize what the crisis is, and two, uh, to crystallize how we can organize ourselves uh, in the, on this platform where everybody comes, and three, how we would manage the transition if this, if we manage to end this junta rule, how do we manage a transition? We have made uh, at least written submissions on all these, and anybody can uh, interact with them. Uh, if anybody wants copies, we have soft copies. Uh, we don't have money to print uh, uh, the hard copies. To, to we, we printed quite many, but we cannot afford to keep on printing. But we have soft copies that we can give so that people print for themselves if they want and make contributions too. You can make suggestions where you think the ideas in those documents are not adequate or they are forte, you can make contributions there. Okay. But we need to have a conscious, very deliberate response and management of the transition ourselves. If we don't, the risk of degenerating into state failure with the very huge and long-standing consequences is quite uh, evident. Okay, um, there's no good, good, I don't know, good determination for a future, really, because it looks like it's, it's really upon us as, as Ugandans. But, Doctor, let's, let's stop that discussion there. We delve into the Balalo question. Uh, this, this issue started appearing way back, 2017, President wrote a directive and you're saying, hey, uh, we do not want the Balalos, the so-called Balalos, in uh, the northern part of this country. Those directives have, uh, with time, come, come, been coming back. We had uh, uh, another one uh, in recently, the most, uh, in uh, May 19th, uh, the President was also directing that uh, by the end of this last month, June, uh, all uh, Balalos should be out of northern Uganda. We are in July now. The president has backtracked on, on his statements, and now he thinks, like, after uh, harmonizing with Geno Saleh, his advisor and brother, uh, he realizes that this is uh, something that maybe there is a solution to it. And uh, I want to just read what you posted on your social media, on your Twitter, uh, following uh, this directive from Mr. President. You said, uh, uh, following Geno Saleh's advice, the Balalo, in quotes, can now continue to stay in Acholi and other parts of northern Uganda executive order suspended, and you continue to say that the contempt Mr. M7 has, has for Ugandans is mind-boggling. What do you mean by his statement, Doctor? Well, first of all, you see, this Balalo, as they are now known. Balalo with guns, by the way. Just yeah, that's add, what, that's, the that's what this Balalo have been living in the northern Uganda, in eastern Uganda long, long before Mr. Museveni became president. They were there. Okay. Uh, I didn't know about it. Actually, I started learning about it 
when we were in the bush war. Because there, I met some of them who were coming from Lango, whose homes had been in Lango. Now, when the war began, they were chased. Uh, some were chased from Lango. Uh, I think for the same reasons that they suspected them to now be uh, subversive. So they chased them and they came, they were now in Buruli, mm. in the uh, Nakasongola areas, in mm. Masindi and so on. And so some joined the NRA. Yes, and they were very fluent in law. <laughs> you could, <laughs> mm. <laughs> they, they, they spoke law like any other person in Lango. You know? Yes, sir. Uh, they had lived there for ages. Some were from Teso. And they can speak at Teso like any other person from Teso. And they had been living there peacefully. There was no problem. So, uh, the trouble of these uh, people who were nomadic herdsmen mm. has r really been now uh, created around the Museveni uh, leadership. Mm. And that is, first of all, because they uh, Museveni uh, sought to treat them as a special group of people uh, uh, and in a manner that uh, uh, undermines other people's interests. How so? Yeah, this is what... Uh, I am coming to because uh, you see he took the view that they were landless and he should settle them. So for a start uh, they took land that was public land uh, gazetted as game reserve, degazetted it and uh, divided it amongst these people. Now, they were not the only landless people. Yes, sir. <laughs> they were also other people who were landless, other people who were uh, yeah, yes. other people who were mm. uh, affected. Yes, sir. There were other people who were affected mm. by uh, the war in Ruero, who were not uh, Balaro, who were displaced, yes, sir. who were not treated in the same way as the other ones. The other ones. Yeah. Uh, secondly, yes, sir. there was the question of ranch restructuring. People who had acquired ranches in Buganda and in Ankole to develop uh, commercial ranching. Uh, now, those people had indeed invested in the developing uh, ranching, uh, fencing, developing uh, water sources and uh, other things related to ranching. Yes, so he, again, without, I think, any uh, political 
consultations and dialogue uh, set out to restructure the ranches to settle the balalo in those ranches. In fact, even before uh, the, uh, the settlement, they were encouraged to invade and occupy the ranches. So they went in and aggressed the ranches and occupied them by force. So they were given land of the ranches while already on the ranches. And, um, uh, and of course, some of the ranchers uh, tried to resist the, the takeover and destruction of their, of their property. So, in response, yes, sir. now Mr. Museveni armed them, armed all the barar. In violation of the law, there was no law providing for such distribution of guns. It was, and, and this is one of the things I think where violation of the Constitution is clear. In violation of the Constitution, in violation of the law, uh, without any framework, he gave guns to all these uh, Balaro, ostensibly to protect themselves against the ranchers. Now, so these guns and uh, their hoarders then started migrating with the guns <laughs> <laughs> to, to other places. So the people, the, 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 the Balalo in northern Uganda now, changed form mm. from those who used to be there with a few cows and uh, uh, living uh, in harmony, in harmony with the others. Uh, uh, some, because also they are Langi, the Langi had their own cows. Uh, now, the, first of all, the cows which were in Lango were decimated by the war. So now, these Balaro who are coming come with a, uh, a, a different outlook. They, 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 they have, they, they are more wealthy, they even want to take over the land and... Yeah, they've bought land and, there, and, they, they and, hire land and, there. And, 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 and mm. have title over it. Yes. Uh, they have guns, so you can't say, you, why, what are you doing here, get away from here. They, 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 they are armed. And, and so this changed the dynamics mm. of, the, of that uh, uh, situation. And of course, the land hoarding in Lango, most of Lango and Acholi, mm. is communal. Mm. So it's not like somebody can uh, sell you his land privately. Mm. But now, because of uh, the poverty in the northern Uganda, where everybody is desperate, some people illegally now try to sell land to these Balaro who are, of course, now capable of buying uh, and in any case of using the land, whether you have allowed or not. Uh, and this is the conflict that is going on there. Addressing it was wrong if to address it the way Museveni addressed it. And he was not genuine. This is why I think that, you know, whatever he says, you don't just... For, and I talked about it when, yes, yeah, when, yeah. when, when we were here, as yes. soon as he made those, uh, uh, those pronouns to say that he's not, he's not genuine. If we go to what you're saying, that means uh, the president is hypocritical to some extent of... Without any doubt, without any doubt. Not only hypocritical, but, uh, 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 you know... He says things he has no intention of ever doing or believing or, you know, I don't know what, uh, what kind of 
words can describe that. It's not just hypocrisy. It's uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's more than that. Uh, I can't, you know, quite get the words to. Uh, he's cynical also. He's cynical. Um, he's, uh, uh, at the end of the day, of course, uh, uh, contemptuous of the people that he's talking to, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's... Uh, it's very sad, but uh, uh, I, I was not surprised uh, when he now wrote the second letter to say, by the way, now I have reflected, having talked to Saleh, I have reflected. I think these people can stay uh, since some uh, have, have acquired the land uh, rightly, since others can acquire land uh, rightly. Let's only look at how they acquire the land. And, uh, no, let's things. also look at that, Doctor, because we don't want to be on one side of, of, of the, the people of Lango, but also the Balalo themselves, because there, there are over 15,000 Balalos now, with over 35,000 cattle. This is a big number. So how do we create a harmony? Uh, because they are still Ugandans. Is, isn't a Ugandan allowed to come from a certain region to go to another region? You see, so as I told you, we as I told balance? you, you will not have a balance unless you have even handedness. Because why are they armed? Why isn't that addressed? Is, must they provide their own security? Isn't there a security system in Uganda that provides security for all? Why do you arm certain communities? Mm. That's where things start going wrong. And provide certain facilities or, or services for them that others cannot access. Because even, you see, this prosperity that Mr. Museveni attributes to cattle keepers, mm. First of all, it's of course not as uh, you know as as great as <laughs> as he wants to make it sound. <laughs> you know that uh, because I hear him, he said milk production has increased two hundred percent. That was in the budget speech. He said milk production has increased two hundred percent, and it's the only sector that has made. That uh, gigantic leap in production. But you need to interrogate it. Mm. You know, how does it come about? So, uh, because uh, as I have said, they were cattle keepers mm. elsewhere. Mm. What happened to them? Those outside your cattle corridor, what happened to their cows? Secondly, the investments that have gone to the cattle corridor to provide for um, an infrastructure for the, for the cattle, uh, milk cooling plants, uh, and uh, how to buy and uh, collecting centers, and I don't know what, and uh, veterinary services, that not, not entirely, you know, the best, but some services there and so on, which other people don't have. And secondly, yes. uh, the government servants who access or even manage large chunks of the budget coming from the cattle corridor <laughs> and therefore ha having investable <laughs> investable capital that they can put there to develop uh, their, 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 their farms and so on that other people do not have. Other cattle keepers like these ones also. Mm. Either other cattle keepers or even other producers whether they are agricultural producers of coffee, of what, of uh, cotton, of whatever, mm. you know. Mm. They, they, they. So it has been a question of services that are provided there, 
a question of people from there having access to capital that they 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 put there because otherwise uh, th th there is nothing no magic that has 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 happened there to create to create to create this uh, if it was not uh, the government jobs including his own his own job because he now says i am a big cattle I'm, but uh, you find uh, he, on on Museven's ranch the doctors there are government doctors, veterinary doctors, <laughs> paid by state house. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> he, he's a parasite. Even the medicine. For yes. He's a, he's a parasite. He's a parasite. So he cannot say, I now have so many cows. Yes, you have so many cows, Mr. Museveni, thanks to my tax. Because it's extractive. You've extracted from elsewhere to build your cows. And, and it's that injustice that creates problems uh, that we are talking about, uh, which must be uh, addressed uh, in, in a transparent uh, manner and in an equitable manner. Mm. Does this, does this uh, mean that uh, we are not solving anything about the Balaro? Really? It's, it's absolutely, a absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. <laughs> because you see, he's trapped, as I have said, between that promotion of uh, what he thinks is right and uh, the others who are, who are wrong and, um, and... No, but I think he knows that this is wrong because he has, he has written before, he has talked about this issue of the Balalo and he knows it is wrong, it is unjust. You see, for lack of a better word, he knows this. But it's like even the, in the recent it, letter, he, it's, he pointed out this issue. But that very, is very well. that, that is what I told you that uh, you know he, 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 it's like there are two people in one. One is one has a mouth speaking from here, another one has a mouth speaking from there, and all of them doing totally different things. So that is that 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 is his approach. He's saying the same things on elections, the political injustice. He's saying yes, you know this is unjust, but who is doing it? The same person. So it's it's he knows they are wrong, mm. but he believe. This is why I say he has contempt for everybody. He believes we we can be deceived. He believes those who are not deceived have no capacity to do anything to stop what he's doing anyway because he has the military might and he will uh, continue doing what he is doing whether you like it or not. You have nothing to do. That's the contempt, part of the contempt that he has for everybody. <laughs> Thank you. And lastly on this issue, now what, what is the role of then Geno Saleh here? In, in your own perspective, what what is Geno Saleh to do? With what advantage is him? Because it's it's a missive that it's from the basis of him at uh, having a conversation with the president that the president feels we can do maybe an extension up to September to find solutions. Well, I I think Saleh possibly is about the honorary person that sometimes actually influences Museven's views. I don't know whether he, his son Muhozi has that kind of influence. I don't, I doubt. Mm. But Geno Saleh does. Okay. Um, and I have stated uh, many times before that this is family rule. Yeah. So it's so that, so, yeah. so that's part of the uh, influence that um, Saleh has on on Mr. Museveni because Museveni believes that if Saleh says something, it's not influenced by anything that could undermine his own interest. <laughs> <laughs> It will be. But, but I, I hope Ugandans listen to the statements you say. Yes. It feels like 
it feels when you say this, that means that okay, at least Salai can listen to him. Yes, this one is not going to harm. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Though, as I have said, I'm not sure that he, he, his son has as much uh, hearing. He, you know, uh, I think he doesn't have as much confidence. <laughs> there, there are some narratives, uh, the recent uh, elections in Bukedia, some people had a school of thoughts, uh, and I can name out a gentleman here who's comfortable, General Vigira, saying that uh, it was Muhozi's interference that brought about that particular letter. So if you say that, maybe I can disagree with you according to, to General Vigira. No, I'm, I'm just saying uh, as much I have been mm. saying, I don't think it is... It's family rule. Everybody in the family has some influence. You know, it's a family rule. Uh, even those who are not soldiers, they, they, they have some influence. You've seen Ruavogo with his uh, um, looking for market. He's the one who can look for market for, 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 for our coffee and all other things. <laughs> yes. The other Ugandans have no capacity to advise on that. So, oh, every member of the family has some influence. Yeah. I was only ranking the influence of Geno Mohozi <laughs> much <laughs> lower. <laughs> this is the interface show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Edgar. I'm still with the Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesiji. That is the Badalo question, and I think uh, uh, we, we, can, we can stop it there and then maybe delve into an issue that has been uh, having a lot of controversy, and that is the DNA. And uh, the controversy is really about the statements that, that you aired out on one of Uganda's TVs. Uh, I don't know if people misquoted you or uh, um, misjudged you or you miscommunicated. Uh, doctor, wh what is really, what, what do you think about the, the DNA question? And this I'm, I'm bringing it to you because you received a, a few backlashes here and there and misinterpretations or people had their own interpretations of what you said. So really, what, what did you mean? No, actually, I don't think that people were misinterpreting me. Yes. I think they were just disagreeing with me, disagreeing. Okay. Uh, which is perfectly in order, mm. and it's an area which, in which I think uh, the kind of disagreement mm. is not unexpected. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a different outlook. My outlook is, gen and I saw some even saying that I said what I said because it's politically right. Nothing to do with the politics. This has nothing absolutely to do with the politics. Mm. Uh, our view on what children are to us. You see, there is a very possessive attitude yes, amongst our people on children. This is my child and treat their child with exception, you know, treat, is, uh, apply all their love and uh, resources and uh, so on, on what they believe is their, their, their children, their biological children. And that's how this whole DNA thing has gained significance and now even tending to become some kind of a craze where everybody wants to establish who the father generally is, not so much the mother, mm -hmm. uh, because they assume, I think, that the mothers are <laughs> generally the same, uh, because they, 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 they mm -hmm. bear the womb and, uh, and eventually produce. But actually, those who produce in hospitals need to be actually a little more careful, because uh, some of our hospitals are not even well equipped to put children bands to identify them as soon as they are born. And so children who are born and put in nurseries, there is quite, quite a high risk mm. of exchanging. Someone them. can pick you another person. Yes, yes, yes. And it happens quite, uh, quite a bit. Yes, Those who, whose children go through nurseries uh, shortly after birth and that have not been properly uh, tagged at the time of birth. But you see, so the question is, you want to care for your biological child, uh, and that's your responsibility. I, I have a challenge with that because, and, and 
maybe my challenge is my my challenge with that is highly tipped in the world view of life because how do we get this life so are you responsible for the life of the of, of your children uh, so what about those even who don't produce uh, are they worthless <laughs> uh, because they have not had biological children, children so sh they should not care <laughs> uh, and my world view is that really children are from God. Yes. Now, Ugandans, and, and this is where I have uh, a challenge with them, the greatest majority of them claim to be religious. You have been seeing their views on homosexuality mm. because the Bible is very clear, the Quran is very clear, the, so they, they, they claim to be religious. But the basis of religion, of sp spirituality and religion is that we are a creation, that it is God who creates, <laughs> that you have no power to, 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 to give life, that God is the giver of life. Yes. So if you believe God is the giver of life, where then do you derive the audacity to say, this one is mine, this one is not mine? All of them belong to God. Yes. You see, just like yourself, you are a, 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 creation, you are, you are a creation of God. So parenthood, in my world view, and I don't expect anybody to, everybody to agree with my world view, I don't, uh, you know, have any problem who is disagreeing. But that's my world view. My world view is that uh, as parents, we are vehicles, we are vessels that are used in that God's creation. You know? Yes, sir. And, and, and even science really backs this, this whole thing of genetics and so on. What, what is the source of the genetics? <laughs> you know? Uh, and, um, and, and, and so, uh, for me, rather than focusing on whether I am a biological father or not, if there is, uh, in, in a marriage, mm. if, if there is infidelity, by my partner and she has a child who is not mine but which child believes is mine and treats me as the father and the mother because she wants to hide her infidelity does not reveal <laughs> any of this now this might not be yours mm. yes mm. Why should I uh, not treat this child as mine? You know? Why should I say, you know, I must look for uh, whether I am the biological person so that, so, so, so what? So that that's when you will look after that child. No. Because even the children who have no parents, I consider should be our children. The children who have parents but who need our support should get our support, those who can support them. Why? Because when children grow and they are endowed, is it the parent that endows the child with all kinds of talents and gifts that children have? I don't believe so. So, it is still God that gifts us with whatever uh, capacities 
we, we develop. So we are just stewards to these children. Yes. Mm. So now, you can have a child who does even not know their parents, but who can be so gifted to save humanity. Yeah. A child can uh, maybe grow up in a sunny baby's home, but he becomes the inventor of a vaccine that saves the world. So, that capacity of that child, uh, if you kill it because it's not your <laughs> biological, <laughs> because it's not your biological thing, and you kill it. And you can, of course, have biological children that are uh, uh, useless. <laughs> so why not embrace all, all children uh, uh, and uh, as a society we make sure all children grow up well and are catered for. And this is both at the level of every uh, parent considering and helping all children they are able to help, but also as a community, as a society, putting in place common capacity to make sure all children grow up well. This is why I have been arguing, for example, that education should not just be a responsibility of parents. No, it should be a public good that every child should access. Mm. Because those who, whom we build knowledge in are not going to use that knowledge to benefit just homes. Mm. The knowledge we build in children benefit humanity, not just even Uganda. They benefit humanity. So it's our duty to build knowledge in all, to make sure all children grow up healthy, that we build knowledge in them and that uh, they become useful uh, people in the world. So this whole thing of, you know, Akange, my, my son, my daughter, my, and uh, to the exclusion of, of other children and uh, to ostracize those that are being found in the homes as uh, biologically uh, not uh, related to, to one of the parents, I think is a wrong approach to take. Yeah, I get you, Doctor. And what you're saying is really beneficial to the people, the country, and to the children themselves. But do you also want to resonate with uh, the father of, of these children, uh, the man who's going to wake up to sweat for, 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 for someone that is not really theirs? Do you want to also... You see, that's why it starts, that this is not mine, so I should not sweat for them. We should sweat for all our children. As I have said, you see, once you, your preoccupation is my child and not seeing the child as simply under your care, God's child under your care. Once your preoccupation is this is my, my. child, then you are bound to have those problems of uh, segregating the, the children in your home, in your neighborhood, in your what, you know, uh, you don't care what is happening to, to the others as much as you want to care for, because you believe you, you know, this is, this is... But, but you also want to think that this is a Ugandan also kind of mentality, because Ugandans have a thing of, I'm okay. They have, they have no, it's not things. just Ugandan. I think it's uh, human weakness, mm. which is selfishness, you know. But in Uganda, it's exaggerated. I remember a statement where you guys talk about corruption, it's too much. Uh, and this gentleman was saying, for me, I wake up in the morning and the man I put in my wallet is still there. So for him, for him, he's okay, really. Maybe he's not okay, but he feels he's okay. And that's the thing that we've had over time, that there are people who are disenfranchised, but nobody really cares. And it's something you've always talked about. Yeah, so, so the, uh, the um, world view we hold eventually advises how we live as a society. Uh, extreme uh, 
uh, selfishness that uh, we have here, in, especially in the elites, mm -hmm. uh, is a large part of the problems that, that we face. For people to believe that I can be well off myself, it doesn't matter what happens to, to others. In fact, some even go beyond wanting to be well off and wanting to see others not well. <laughs> <laughs> others suffering. Yes, actively causing suffering as they improve their own bit. Not knowing they are just creating a trouble for, for themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is something that should be discussed, uh, not as superficially, I think, as it is being discussed about uh, mainly and faithfulness of partners. <laughs> but how we, how we view uh, human beings, uh, 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 are we equal? Uh, are we responsible for our own lives that, you know, it's my father who, 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 who is responsible for me, who gave birth to me, and who is uh, attributable only, whom I am attributable to only. Mm. Uh, these are questions that we need to interrogate. And this is why even in, in all these uh, religious groups, there is a lot of hypocrisy. Yes. Because, you know, when, when we talk about this, which touches on self, oh, it becomes, <laughs> even you find you know, religious leaders saying, no, 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 this one. <laughs> There's no compromise. So, so then what, because, uh, you know, like in the Islamic faith, this whole philosophy of Ummah uh, and Jani are very important. So, we are all, the, uh, the whole idea mm. is that we are all God's, the children of Allah. Mm. We are all, uh, so, and we are brothers and sisters. That's why even you hear what we call the Muslim brotherhood. Yeah. We are brothers and sisters, children of Allah. Of, of Allah. Mm. So if we are brothers and sisters, children of Allah, why do you, uh, why are you preoccupied? <laughs> that they are actually children of Edgar <laughs> and not your... <laughs> why, why are you preoccupied? Because both you, Edgar, and me, we, we are brothers and we are children of Allah. These children who are here are also children of Allah. So why shouldn't we look after them similarly? They are our jami. So, and that is the same in the Christian faiths. It's the same... Uh, that we are all God's children. Yes, that's true. And God created us so that we give glory mm -hmm. to God, you know? Yes, sir. And that we love each other as we love ourselves. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, doctor, we've come to the end of this discussion. And uh, what, oh, what, it's what ending is your... rather quickly. Yes, today. sorry, but uh, <laughs> I think time flies when you're having interesting conversations. <laughs> okay. So, um, generally, doctor... We didn't you... have people making comments. Uh, uh, some, some are there, but... Um, I think we, time, has time has really caught, uh, you caught up. me, caught mm. up in this. I cannot read a few of them. But thank you so much, guys, uh, for watching. So, so doctor, um, just lastly, give us your parting shot and uh, uh, anything else that you'd want the people to take away from this particular episode. Well, first of all, to express my, uh, you know, great gratitude to all of you who uh, spare time and spare resources to mm. tune into this program. Uh, and to really uh, seek that, because th the reason uh, I come here to share these views is hoping that these views can be uh, shared widely. Mm. So I really uh, beg, request, uh, implore, any and all of you who uh, attend to these uh, programs, find a way of sharing these views with as many people as you can in all forms that you can. 
in your WhatsApp groups, in whatever, you can take bits and pieces that um, uh, are of interest to you and, uh, and share them. And uh, <laughs> lastly, to simply emphasize the whole question of our active participation. We shall not get away from the kinds of injustices that now threaten to turn into um, a, a country of, of, of a failed state. Uh, the way to get out of this is for every citizen to be active in creating a common uh, solution to our problems. Uh, and I will be uh, in the coming days speaking far more on this uh, from our red card front. Thank you very much and God bless you. Have a great week. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Doctor. Always a privilege having you on the show. And of course, the people who are watching us every day, thank you so much. We'll meet again next week on Saturday. The Interface Show happens on ten, at 10 a.m. up to midday. We're always here having a conversation with Tad Kano, Dr. Kiza. Thank you so much for uh, everything, the messages you've sent in. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to read a few, but uh, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll meet again next Saturday. Please do. Uh, tune in and you can also follow us on our socials at the Alternative Uganda Facebook at Digitalk TV still on Facebook at the Alternative Uganda YouTube uh, Digitalk TV YouTube then also on Twitter at the Alternative Uganda myself at Edgar M. Karuhanga Twitter Facebook and all other social media platforms from the entire team thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk.